Transform is about revolution, not evolution. So that's the first point. This is a revolution. We're not going to achieve 70% renewables on a power system in 2030 without a revolution. The power system, it's not about the grid anymore. It's about all of the ecosystem. Every bit of this complex jigsaw, including the market, including yeah. renewables, including system stability, etc. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Fedderson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, and on the show today... I'll be speaking with the person responsible for keeping the lights on in one of Europe's most ambitious electricity systems in terms of their decarbonisation goals over the next decade. Uh, My guest today is Mark Foley from uh, CEO of Airgrid uh, PLC. Welcome, Mark. Great pleasure, John. Greetings from Wicklow, the Garden of Ireland, about 40 kilometres south of the capital city, Dublin, and lovely to talk to you. It's been a long time since we met in beautiful Oxford, well over a year ago. In, indeed, and hopefully we'll have the chance to at some point in the in the in the near future. I think that's in the in the hands of the gods at the moment. So, so do do I take it from that that you're working from home at the moment, and that most of the most of the head office is? I left the office on, I think it was Thursday, the nineteenth of March, and bar a couple of. Uh, occasional visits into the office for some face-to-face meetings with colleagues, um, observing social distancing, of course. I've been working in my back bedroom since then, at board meetings, everything from here, and 550 people seamlessly transitioned to working from home, and absolute credit go to the IT people in Airgrid, because they're much maligned very often, IT people, but by goodness, have they delivered on our behalf. It's been a an extraordinary experience is the only word for it. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like being a goalkeeper in football, isn't it? Sort of you you, you know people notice when it, it's not going well, but they tend not to notice when it when it's going very well. But I hear you know a number of stories of sort of praise for the IT team and frankly the the team more broadly uh, who are who are, who are making who are making this work. Um, just by way of introduction before we get into the content, uh, Mark's had a varied career path uh, and and is a chemical engineer by training. Uh, as I believe he entered the power sector through Quilter, uh, which is a state-owned uh, commercial forestry business uh, in Ireland, uh, and had enormous success there, really spearheading the, the onshore wind business uh, and developing over 400 megawatts of onshore wind generation. Uh, he then took over Airgrid as the chief executive in 2018 at a pretty critical time. Uh, so Ireland, uh, or the, you know, the all-Ireland market had essentially, in the move to the ISM, achieved or was endeavouring to achieve what had taken other European countries 10 to 20 years to implement in a very short space of time. Uh, he took that over, uh, and at least from the outside, it looks like it's, 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 go- it's, going, it's going pretty well. Um, but just briefly on that, Mike, what's, what's been the hardest part about the ISM implementation? And yeah, what's been the challenge? Oh, I, I, I was in my old life in February 2018. This is a bit of an interesting anecdote and was in front of a, my board and talking about the risk attendant to my renewables and their renewables portfolio deriving from ISEM. And we had heard that ISIM was going to be implemented in May of 2018. And lo and behold, I land the Airgrid job. I arrive in Airgrid in June. ISIM has still not been implemented. Mm-hmm. And it had, the changeover was going to happen on my watch with me oh. in the hot seat on the 1st of October 2018. Um, it happened seamlessly. I remember being in Shelburne Road at one minute to midnight on the Sunday night. And frankly, the butterflies were raging in my stomach, but I have to hand it to the Airgrid crew and I deserve zero credit because <laughs> I came in as a, as a former worried developer thinking I could lose my shirt yeah. in this new market. 
And it wasn't easy. I mean, the implementation had gone on for years, but I saw the post-implementation period. And my goodness, you know, the market didn't see what stresses and strains and challenges the people had to cope with to bed down the system and to debug it and to keep it stable. Um, the market never saw the pain and torture my team went through and, and the hours and the late hours and the weekends and the on-call. But I think, you know, sitting here today, middle of 2020, an extraordinary achievement has been delivered. Indeed. We're trading on a pan-European basis. The system never fell over. Mm. Nobody was subjected to serious losses of any, any description. The power system did not fail. And that's the ultimate test. The test is a binary one because when it fails, it fails catastrophically. Yeah. But my goodness, behind the scenes, it was, it was pretty brutal in terms of what people had to put up with and had to deliver. But my goodness, uh, many a boy became man and many a girl became lady uh, or woman at, 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 the, at the end of this process. But we're, we're well out of it and we're, well, we're looking ahead and looking to 2030 now. Yeah, and I and I personally did interact with some of your colleagues at the time, and you could tell it was a, you know, you could tell it was clearly a stressful experience. And your market participants were also you know, struggling to adapt, I think, and getting used to it. But um, as you as you say, the lights are either on or off, and they and they and they stayed on. How, how far into debugging and stability? So you talked about debugging and, and stability and these things. I mean, are we sort of a hundred percent there? Are we ninety percent? And there's sort of always a few bits and. I think you're 90, you're 90 percent there, but I mean, you know, with these very, very complex mar uh, market yeah. systems, and the fact that ISEM has the market and the power system umbilically linked now. I mean, that's the fundamental difference. You had the power system in one corner and the the market in another part of ISEM, but now they're, from an IT perspective, they're in, in, inextricably linked, and the market is basically sending instructions to the power system as to what to what to switch on and what to switch off. But look, we're we're in a very stable state, but there is an ongoing and, and never ending, I, I would suggest, mm. continuous improvement, hoovering up of small issues, yeah. uh, bringing them into a new issue of software and, and, and staying current and staying on top of all the issues. And, I, you know, that's, that's never ending. And the continuous improvement journey goes on forever. So, but look, we're very, very stable. And, and some of the people have done a superb job. And do you ever get the sense that it's been a heartening, heartening experience for other countries that are thinking about major reforms? Do you ever hear from other systems that, you know, I, think, I remember at the time Aurora's research was saying that, you know, these guys are moving pretty, pretty quick by the standards of most other countries. Do you think it's been it's sort of encouraging for other systems that are thinking about this sort of transformation? We probably get more of an emphasis and more of an interest from third parties around the levels of renewables on the power system because I think markets in every jurisdiction almost have their own identity, their own mm. nuanced configuration. While they're all, it might be pan-European trading, etc., but everybody has their own bespoke um, system. But when it comes to the, the level of renewables on the power system, and it's either X or it's Y or whatever, there is, there is a, a massive interest in, in how we're accommodating renewables. And that tends to be the bias. Yeah. And we get, we get huge interest in understanding how we're, how we're making all of this work mm -hmm. um, and how we're planning this incredibly ambitious um, program arising out of our government's climate action plan from last year. Yeah, interesting. And I'd like to get into some of the specifics a bit of the of, of your plans around making sure the grid keeps keeps running as as we get more of these variable sources of power on the grid. But one one thing that struck me is uh, the mission statement you introduced at AirGrid. I was perusing the website, uh, and your mission statement is transform the power system for future generations. And of course, that's linked with the with the 70% renewables target for, for, for 2030 that the government's adopted. Do you think, just on the mission, so asking you as a, as a CEO and as a, as a leader, what role do you think that mission plays in the organisation? Why is it important to have a mission and, I, and, and why did you choose that one in particular? I love this mission, this part, we call it our purpose. Uh, and I'll tell you a small story. So I joined Airgrid in June, 2018. I met the board in July 2018 on an off-site and they asked me to come up with a new strategy for the company and I asked them, what ambition do you have for this company? And over a day, we trashed out 
a real sense that the board wanted us to be ambitious, wanted, wanted us to be for, forward thinking, wanted us to be at the cutting edge in terms of transformation. But it was all pretty generic. They, they couldn't, put very, couldn't put specifics on it, but they said, mark away and come up with a strategy that matches our ambition and the legacy many of us want to lead. I made one critical decision on that. I decided we would do the strategy in-house and that we would not get the big shot consultants in for a six month commission to come up with a strategy in a dark room and then come back and unveil it to the staff. Yeah. The result of that was it took us 12 months instead of six. Yeah. I did use process management consultants who kept us honest. Uh, myself and the exec were hands on and then about 150 to 200 staff had very significant input into, into the strategy. And as, as we, the, the proposition started to crystallize, we were very fortunate because the government appointed a new minister for climate action and he started to become very ambitious mm -hmm. and started to talk about the need for climate action. Now, a lot of this came from our prime minister becoming embarrassed at, at Ireland's status in Europe as being at the bottom of the table in terms of performance. So we had this lovely confluence of events, an embarrassed prime minister he put one of his best ministers into place. He started working on a climate action plan. And of course, we were working on a strategy that was to be ambitious. And the whole lot came together really, really well. And completely against the textbooks, we delivered the, the main themes around our strategy and then said we'd look at the purpose. Most companies do it the other way around. We asked 50 members of staff to give us a purpose statement that speaks to the ambition. Yeah. And the staff came up with that. And that's what I'm most proud of, John. I didn't come up with this. 50 members of staff who had worked on various aspects of the strategy came up with this. And let me explain, the, there's three critical dimensions to this. Transform is about revolution, not evolution. So that's the first point. This is a revolution. We're not going to achieve 70% renewables on a power system in 2030 without a revolution. The power system... It's not about the grid anymore. It's about all of the ecosystem. Every bit of this complex jigsaw, including the market, including yeah. renewables, including uh, uh, system stability, etc. And lastly, and the one that I think connected deeply with staff was future generations. What legacy are we leaving? I have two grandchildren. I have three sons and two grandchildren. What legacy are we going to leave those people? So. I was just blown away when the staff came up with that. And it, it's always a pleasure to speak to that simple but very powerful um, statement. And it, we, we've done the research. It connects deeply into our organization yeah. and has really resonated. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's a, and I speak as a former strategy consultant, one of those strategy houses, sort of, yeah, the insult, I, I mean, I, I, I agree. I don't see the logic really in outsourcing strategy. You kind of need to own the purpose and then own, own, own the plan. Um, you, you probably save yourself a fortune in, in fees as, as, as well. Um, you, talked about, you talked about political support um, and the, the, the minister, minister Bruton presume, presumably uh, there. Um, we've had an election last week. What does that just, to, and there's a new coalition and the Greens made it into the coalition. Yep. What does that what does that mean for the trajectory now? Does it change the amb does it change the ambition? Does it change your job? Um, I think Richard Bruton has been one of the finest ministers in the history of of, of ministers in in the Irish government since Ireland became a sovereign state a hundred years ago. The climate action plan is 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 as when I talk when I look back in a hundred years of Irish history and I pick those seminal moments of what I would call transformational government policy, the Climate Action Plan um, is absolutely right up there. It sets an ambition for Ireland to achieve 70% renewables on average on the power system in 20, 2030. Just think about it. Last year, we achieved 36%. It's doubling what we've got, right? Yeah. It means that um, on an instantaneous basis to achieve... 70% on average, you have to be able to run the power system at close to 100% renewables when the, when, the, when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. Yeah. So it's, it's as ambitious as any country in the world, particularly when you look that we're an island system with modest interconnection. Yeah. And frankly, um, the, you know, with the new government, I would say two things. One is deep relief that 
the, the main party are still in there and they're in coalition with uh, another centre, I call it centrist party, but the Greens are ensuring they have a majority. What it means for the, what it means to me is two things. One is the climate action plan is alive and well and we get all the support and focus that is necessary. But on the broader scheme of, let's for example, talk about the Paris Agreement, it is looking to be even more ambitious and maybe beyond just electricity and what electricity can support into other areas of the economy. So as a citizen, more than as the CEO of Airgrid, it is about a much higher ambition, but a broader ambition, because frankly, the Climate Action Plan, it picked on the successful actors, which is the power system and said, drive it to its almost ultimate limit. Um, but there's, the Greens have brought in other dimensions. So it, I think this new government, which was in the balance up till eight o'clock last Friday night, has an ambition for a country in relation to decarbonisation that's right up with the best and most progressive in the world. And I'm, I, I think we have an incredible opportunity in the lifetime of this government, which typically is about five years. Yeah, yeah. And it is, I mean, you touch on, you touch briefly on, you know, it being an island system, no, you know, a long way from the centre of Europe. And, and I understand that poses substantially more challenges in decarbonisation than, than it might be if you were... If well, you were, we, we're not Denmark. We're big, no. trans <laughs> lines shooting into in Central Europe where you can offload massive amounts of, of power. We have a 600 megawatt interconnector to, the UK, to Ireland, to Britain, and then one between Northern Ireland and Scotland, which is only transmits in one direction, um, which is, I think, 400 megawatts. So our level of interconnection is very, very modest. And at the centre of our strategy is another interconnector to France. And indeed, there's a private sector proposition between Ireland and the UK, which I am consistently and vocally supportive of we cannot have enough interconnection in the next decade if we're going to make this whole thing work yeah okay and we might so that's the that's the the green link and the and the celtic link um, that's correct yep we might we might touch on those a little bit later um can i ask so that's great so covid19 you know i I'd, I'd be remiss not to mention it briefly particularly yeah. in the context of particularly around what you say around high renewables penetration and a lot of people are saying in a sense this gave us a glimpse of the future because demand is r- relatively low the thermal capacity is going off the grid and we're, and we're seeing much higher renewable penetrations what what struck you about what happened on the all island system uh, during the during the COVID nineteen restrictions, yeah, and and this is really important because um, because we're slightly the the proposition in Ireland is slightly different from mainland Europe. So let me answer this in two parts. Firstly, I just really want to acknowledge what pleased me most about the COVID was the whole crisis was the way our crisis management team dealt with the issue. We moved about ten days ahead of the government with two objectives: protect staff welfare and ensure the power system and the market are not subject to any disruption. We didn't have a single case of COVID among 600 staff across the island. Everybody has been safe and the power system and the market have functioned without a glitch. So that's the, that's the first thing, I, I think. How did we deal with the crisis? Secondly, and this may surprise you, John, I don't know. The big surprise we got was the disparity between the drop in demand between the UK and Ireland. So as you know, we run the power system across the market in two jurisdictions, Northern Ireland and Ireland, and, Ireland, mm. and we're fully integrated. Northern Ireland showed a drop of about 20%, which was consistent with mainland UK. Ireland's drop was, was closer to only 10%. And mm-hmm. a bit of scratching around and analysis appears to, to, to uh, relate to the ecosystem of data centers in Ireland, both the hyperscales yeah. and the more traditional operators some of whom told me they had 30% growth during the lockdown. Interesting. 30%. Staggering. All those now, Zoom the, meetings or something. Well, the other thing is, I mean, I'm working, I'm working from home. I never look at my, on my, um, my bills from my supplier of um, TV, Wi-Fi, etc. My personal data consumption at home went up between January and April by a factor of 15. So, and, you, and as you know, all the big global IT companies are here in Ireland. So what, what yeah. we've... We've, we've observed is our Ireland, the Irish market was very resilient and it's already recovered substantially. Now, there were shifts in terms of 
patterns, the, the graph, when was electricity being consumed less in the early morning because people were working from home and it was a bit offset and more at lunchtime, etc. But generally speaking, Ireland, we're a bit of an outlier. Our drop was modest. It's not significant in terms of, you know, our planning for the next number of years. Mm -hmm. and, and, and more more relevant, I suppose, as we look to 2030, the data center community will likely drive significant increase in demand in Ireland in the next decade of the order of 30 to 35 percent. So while we have a decarbonization challenge of enormous proportions, we have to do it on the back of very, very strong growth and demand for electricity, which mm -hmm. is not you don't see that in any other country in Europe. And what does, what does a demand centers load profile look like, just out of interest? Um, is it fairly stable or, or is there a daily? Oh, it's very thing? stable. I mean, these guys go on and they stay on yeah, and okay. uh, they never go off. And, um, and they're just growing. Um, I mean, clearly Amazon have a big presence. All the big ICTs mm. have a big footprint in Ireland. Amazon, Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, all have a strong footprint in Ireland. And the reality, it's, you know, Ireland has, uh, one of Ireland's great success stories has been foreign direct investment. In the 70s, we had the pharmaceutical companies. In the 80s, we had the emerging, you know, computer type companies. And then in, in, in the latter time, then we had the dot-com sort of era of the internet devices. And now we have the data centers. Um, and these guys have footprints that doesn't, just speak to the Irish no. indigenous demand, economic demand. They speak to demand that they are are, are um, generating right across Europe. So I yeah. think the statistic is thirty percent of Europe's data is is playing through Ireland. And with that comes yeah. So it's yeah. we have a we have a unique ecosystem which just makes the challenge greater for myself and my team because we have to decarbonize, but equally we have to cope with demand. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we um we spend a fortune on on cloud computing at Aurora, running our big your power models, and it, it yeah. I think they sort of the, the way you get it cheaper is you you know you use it when it's when it's two a.m. in California or something, and you get yeah, routed yeah. to some data center. So so presumably the same thing happens in the middle of the night in Ireland as as as, as well. Um, great. Okay, very, very interesting. And I suppose you look at the NASDAQ or some of those, some of those tech stocks and actually they're at all-time highs. Um, they're all-time highs. Despite yeah. what COVID's done. So they're defying, they're defying gravity in these, this COVID time, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Could I... So I'd like to drill in a bit onto the energy transition and two areas in particular, sort of the renewables build-out, which, you know, in Ireland is am ambitious, particularly for an island system and and then to the networks bit now you've got a you've got a unique perspective on renewables because as you say um before you were in the, i suppose it's a good example of skin in the game you know, before you were in, in this seat you were you were you were explaining what someone in this seat should should be doing but yeah. what what was it at quilter that enabled you to be a successful renewables developer was it just the right time right place or what what were the what were the success factors do you think back then in ireland um, I think, you know, I, I, as you said, uh, prior to my career to career, I had no experience in the energy sector. I'd spent 18 years in high tech, um, in high tech uh, American multinationals. And, and just before Quilta, I had transitioned into um, infrastructure. I just finished the 1.2 billion euro uh, development of Dublin Airport and indeed Shannon Airport and Cork Airports. So I I kind of drifted into an infrastructure type career. So when I went into Quilta um, to run a business, which Quilta had seven percent of the land mass of Ireland, forestry doesn't make much of a return, although it makes a stable return. Mm -hmm. It had a valuable asset, so a mass, a huge asset in the form of the land mass. Remember, seven percent of the country. It was selling off land to res developers as. Mm. Uh, they were getting a lot of money for it, but like there was no understanding of the value chain uh, yeah. that was in, in development of renewables. And I basically went to the chief executive and the board and as with sheer determination and grit, I said, guys, what are we doing selling this off? We should be a player in this space. We have the prime competitive advantage, which is a phenomenal asset. Yeah. Okay. We don't have the team, but I'll get you the team. I'll build the team. I've just, spend done over a billion euros worth of infrastructure i know how to do this kind of stuff it might might be an airport it's it's, it's renewables but we'll, we'll figure it out pretty quickly 
So, um, I mean, I could just see the value being lost and, and the opportunity to, the commercial opportunity was, was staggering, you know. And it was at a time when Ireland was, it was, Ireland was in a depression post the crash, but was booming in the renewable space because you had the refit in place, you had the gate three process, and, and people were crashing ahead with projects in anticipation of being able to connect. So I managed to convince a conservative forestry company board to, to let me go, get on. I did it bit by bit. I said, give me the money to do the development phase. Give me the money to build the, uh, the, the yeah. team. And we might sell it at develop, and I can promise you multiples of your money. But I expanded the team from one to 24. We built one of the best development teams in the country. And we built, I got the board step by step to committing to actually building, financing, et cetera, a 400 megawatt portfolio. Probably some of the best onshore wind assets you'll ever see in, in, in a lifetime. Some of them were staggering in terms of capacity factor and their, their return on investment. And we also readied up a thousand megawatt pipeline for the long-term future, which was the 2030. I could see that 2030, if Ireland was going to be serious about where it needed to be, uh, a, 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 a thousand megawatt pipeline was very, very realistic and very viable considering the quality of our assets because there were upland sites with very, very high uh, capacity factors mm. and very competitive relative, relative to others. So um, it was sheer determination and, and as success breeds success. Um, however, in their wisdom, they sold the operating assets, much to my disappointment. I said, look, um, their ambition didn't match mine. So I moved on and I was incredibly um, just privileged and delighted to land the air grid job because I'd had my own personal epiphany in respect of, you know, this is not just about building wind farms and making a lot of money. This is actually about making a difference yeah. in decarbonizing economy and society. So I've had, and a lot of that came about because I became a granddad and I, I just really had a long look in the mirror at what I wanted and what I wanted to achieve. And I said, I want to make a really big difference. And the only way to do that is to work in a company that has ambition or where I'm at the top and I can create that ambition and get board support. So yeah. here I am. It's, it's, been a, it's been a really common theme on, in the podcast recently of sort of, you know, the younger generation, whether that was Amber Pinchbeck or Chris Hunt recently talking about, uh, you know, the 20, you know, the, the graduates who, who were just you know, want a career in the energy transition and electricity is no longer the sort of dull, slow moving sector that it was 30 years ago uh, to, you know, grandchildren and, 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 and stewardship and custodianship for the next generation. It seems to be quite a powerful force in the, in the movement to decarbonise at the moment. Um, just think, just yeah. think the perfect encapsulation of that, I mean, the TSO's community are possibly one of the most conservative I've ever come across in my career. But we've moved from a, a, a sort of a, a perspective about keeping the lights on, which couldn't be more reductionist or, or regressive, to yeah. transforming a power system for future generations. Just think of that giant yeah. leap in terms of the psychology or the philosophy of an organization. We're, we're gone from, from staid and traditional to cutting edge and, and transformational. It has been a staggering what has happened in a short number of years. And in many, many countries, as people have woken up and whether it's Greta Thunberg, whether it's senior politicians who got wake up calls, but the change that has happened in the last 24 months is staggering. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think, so, so you said 36% renewables last year, um, looking to go to 70 pretty quickly. Do you think government's role is going to change? You, you mentioned the refit scheme, which was the old one that, basically took all of the risk, you know, balancing risk, all of those things off, um, off, off renewables generators. And we've moved to the rest scheme, which is more like a CFD. You've got the, you've got the, you, know, you pay some of the balancing costs. If the price goes negative, it's, you're just exposed to more market forces. Do you, do you see government's role in renewables development changing much over the next decade? Or do you think we've got the tools, the tools no. in the all island system to, to, to get to that 70%? Government role is changing. So if I was having this conversation with you, um, John, eight, two and a half years ago, it would be quite negative. It would be possibly finger pointing at government. It would be concerned about lack of policy frameworks and, and a sense of um, this is going to happen very, very slowly. The Climate Action Plan in Ireland has transformed the whole 
that that, that, that whole um, sentiment, shall I say, um, government has said we, we need to get from here to here. Secondly, government has put in very explicit policy objectives. Perfect example being facilitate changing legislation to facilitate offshore. Ireland cannot deliver this ambition without offshore. We need, we currently have four and a half thousand megawatts on the Irish system. That's Ireland, excluding Northern Ireland today. There are thereabouts, onshore wind. We need to treble that. We need to add another 10,000 megawatts of which half need to be offshore. The government gets that. We're not disputing the numbers. We're not disputing the statistics. And the government is committed to new legislation next year to facilitate offshore wind in the Irish Sea. That's an example of affirmative action. Now, it's not perfect. There are wrinkles, there are lacunae, there are bits and there, there are guidelines around onshore wind that could be a bit defective and need to be properly remedied. But in terms of the general thrust, the sentiment, identifying the issues that are in the government space, then I think we have a very, very strong framework on which to move forward. Hmm. It, it's interesting. You, you talked about offshore wind there. And it, to me, it feels like, you know, the, the all island system has been a bit slow to embrace offshore wind. It's my, you know, I see it happening across, across Europe, at least across Northern Europe. Do you, and then I, I think recently the government's even added a couple of gigawatts to what it was planning as part of its targets. When, so do you, do you think it's been a bit slow to act? And, and when do you think offshore will actually arrive in, 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 in the, in the ISM? It's, it's easy to be, you know, it's easy to be critical and say government has been slow and it's probably been to a degree slow, but part of Ireland's great success, remember at the end of this year, we'll be close to 40% renewables on the power system. What other country in Europe has achieved that? And part of, I think part of the psychology in government has been the, the, the onshore wind phenomenon in Ireland has been as good as any country in the world. Mm. I mean, from in the space of 15 years, we've built an ecosystem of incredible, I mean, development capability. Refit has delivered, the government policy has delivered, and, and Ireland's going to hit its Res E target at the end of 2020, which is an incredible achievement when you think about it. So it might be easy to knock the government and say, what were you doing about offshore? Now, the one criticism one might have had is that get the, le the legislative framework for offshore, as in a modern 21st century legislative framework, will only come in next, next year. Mm. But, but, and you could say, why didn't they do that two or three years ago? But look, what is, what is emerging um, in Ireland is a strong legislative framework, legacy projects with a lot of capital having already been invested in surveys, et cetera, in the Irish Sea, very high quality developers. And I can absolutely say with hand on heart, when these guys build, which they will be doing, I would think within three to four years, mm -hmm. start building, you will see LCOEs that are absolutely staggeringly low. Yeah. So in some respects, sometimes a delay can work to your advantage if what's going to arrive is incredibly potent and compelling technology, highly efficient, low cost, etc. I had the great pleasure of visiting SSE's Project Beatrice in the North Sea, 7.8 megawatt turbines, I think a hundred of them. I mean, the standard of engineering, the quality is, was breathtaking. They want to bring that to Arclo. So Ireland's yeah. going to benefit from proven top-end technology landing on in the Irish Sea and delivering, I think, staggering pricing. So we're a bit late. But if we, if we deliver on government targets in the next 15 months around legislation and paving the way, then these guys are serious players and they'll get going very, very quickly. Yeah, so certainly. I mean, as in many cases where technology costs are coming down, it may well be better to be a, to be a fast follower than a, than a first mover in a, in a sense. And certainly it looks like the ambition there is to be far, fast in, in following. Just briefly, is it a in terms of the seabed rights? Just just out of interest to me, is it a is it a sort of competitive process to the seabed rights, or do you have a sense of who's developing which areas 
already the people have their have their patches already yeah a lot of them have their patches the government did a, made a smart move really in the sense that and they 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 um afforded relevant project status to six legacy projects yeah um which is people who were trying to develop consent under an old maritime legislative regime which dated back 70 80 years from which never envisaged large scale turbines, large turbines in the sea yeah. and i thought it was a very good move it it respected those those um developers and they can move on now and complete their studies and start working on their environmental impact assessments etc and then the yeah. seventh project is sse have as they would argue and i think it's a reasonable case they have a fully robust uh, consent under the old regime, which they want to execute, which is about 500 megawatts off the Arklo coast. Yeah. So there's, there's a good ecosystem embedded, good quality companies. Uh, the speculative developers were bought out by the big guys who know what they're on about. Mm. And so there's, there's real horsepower out there ready to go. Right. Okay. Could I, could I change? So we've talked about renewables, which get, you know, obvious, for obvious reasons, gets a lot of the attention when we talk about the energy transition. You know, people talk about seventy percent renewables on the system and these types of things. For my mind, at least, the networks element is as important, and, and in your role, you know, possibly more important. So one of the where I'd like to start is one of the big reforms when we brought in the ISM was the DS three reforms around ancillary services markets balancing you know this sort of paying people to, to you know to flex flex up and down and those types of things are you are you seeing that those tools are helping you to manage the grid and are they going to be a big part of the way you you know maintain frequency stability those types of things in you know as you're running close to 100 re- percent renewables so i would describe this as follows john and it's a really good question es3 has delivered a power system that today can handle, last Sunday was going at 65% renewables in the power system. And we expect to get that to 70% on an instantaneous basis by quarter one of next year. And by any objective criteria, um, you, you, could ba- you can basically say DS3 has delivered, which, is, which sees us through to 21, 22, that sort of time frame. We're currently, tooling up for the next we're calling it ds3 plus but nobody likes the term but so we'll we'll we leave that for another day when we rebrand it which is the job from now to 2025 2026 whereby we can say the power system can operate at 95 to 100 percent renewables so consider this to be phase two we've we've uh, reorganized our business um we have a new chief innovation and planning officer under which this, this resides. We will be appointing somebody to leading the, that program. And we're out to uh, the OJU. Um, we're looking for partners to come on the journey with us for the next number of years. So we're, we're looking to pick one or maybe more world leading companies who can add value to our experience set within our business and basically put together a combined team to work out what the proposition for near 100 percent renewables will look like yeah and then and then the final piece of the jigsaw is we're involved in some general collaborative ventures you mentioned australia and 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 ERCOT and others there's about six or seven tso's who are, are who are engaging in a collaborative venture to, all who have the same common purpose, which is close to 100% renewables. So there's a new game on, and that will look to identify what the scarcity, scarcities are, what the potential solutions are, what the market solutions might be, such that we can engage with regulators and policymakers and ensure the market can deliver those solutions. So Brilliant. we're just we're tooling up for yeah. that as we speak. Yeah, and a re- reassuring to hear that there is that sort of cross pollination of ideas across absolutely across TSOs. I think one that- of the big the one of the big themes of our strategy. We've got fourteen themes, and they combine into four mega themes. Is partnership. Yeah. We are not going to try and do this on our own, and it's going to be a combination of commercial partnerships, and then deep 
network related partnerships with like-minded TSOs. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say, I mean, I, I spend, you know, I don't know, I don't know a de- depth about any particular market, but I spend my life moving between power markets in Europe, in Australia, in the U S and uh, they're all, they're all variations on the same problem. So, um, so yeah. they have a higher renewable penetration. So g- good to hear that's happening. But there's a very simple kind of principle here. Um, you can have all the best technological solutions in the world. If the market can't enable these solutions getting to market in a fair and reasonable way by which they can be remunerated for delivering those services or that technology, then you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. Yeah. That, and that's, I mean, we could have a whole podcast on the role of, on the role of markets and I, I entirely share your view on, um, you know, if it, yeah, the, the, com- the complexities of coordinating things if you're not going to if you're not going to use markets for doing things that markets are, are, are good at. We may come to that briefly. Then, C- can I ask how do you see the relative role? So, so you've talked about interconnection. There's of course also the north south interconnection within within the all island system, which is a you know at the moment we've got some some reasonably big constraint problems on, on the island of Ireland at the moment. How do you see the balance between, you know, copper and, and more wires and kind of the, the, you know, the smarter stuff, batteries, electric vehicles, demand side response. How, how do you see their relative roles in, in getting towards that hundred percent renewable system? I think it's really, really important. If you look at the, the challenge that's in front of us that the, we have an honest debate about this and and for me or anybody else to 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 not call it out and say we are going to need more wires that's a simple matter of physics and capacity etc yeah and anybody who peddles the line that you have enough wires just use smart devices is being is being you know is misleading or being yeah. disingenuous so very simply We need more wires. That's a simple statement of fact. We need to upgrade existing infrastructure. Simple fact. But thirdly, and I'm a mega fan of this, having worked in technology for all of my private sector career in in electronics and chemicals, we can get more out of what we've got and we can deploy intelligence um, at a level never previously conceived in the TSO world because it didn't have to do it. Um, it was is, was a world that relied very much on the singular dimension of the wire, the pylon, and the guarantee of the of the physics of the situation. So we really have to wake up and wise up and look at every piece of new technology that you can deploy on a wire that gives you flexibility, gives you greater utilization, makes the whole thing thing more efficient. So I mean, that's that's a simple fact. And then. I think the other side, as you move to um, maybe a little bit more into the distribution system, the role of intelligence and intelligent devices in terms of avoiding the distribution system in, in the new world that is intensively electrified, avoiding it becoming a, a, a crisis point Um, whereby the system A could fall over or where peak demand goes to ridiculous levels um, and and drives, you know, nonsensical investments in infrastructure or indeed generation capacity. I think think we really have to look at that very, very carefully. I'll give you a a best best illustration. I drive an electric car, so I drive an electric Golf. It's 100% electric. I have it for two years. I have 50,000 kilometers on the clock. When I come home in the evening, and I plug my car in, all I care is that it's available at six in the morning. I really don't care when it gets charged or what decision-making takes place. I just want certainty. So I think the opportunity in the distribution system for intelligent intelligence, and these are not expensive or complex devices. We were using this stuff in chemicals back in the the late 80s, early 90s. Technology is there. Intelligence, I think, can, can allow the the smart decisions that don't diminish the customer expectation or experience but doesn't create ludicrous demands on the system yeah yeah interesting sorry about that that sounded like a rant or no no very interesting and the you know the that initial point of uh we're going to need more copper (laughs) uh you know renew renewables are not like centralized generation uh and you need to optimize 
location yeah. for a variety of things. The cost of land, the yield of the yield of the wind farm, and the cost of the copper means that uh, means that we're gonna we're gonna need quite a bit more. So I, it, 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 you know, it's 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 useful. I suppose it's one of those. Um, you know, one of those things in the energy transition where sometimes people try to oversimplify things, um, but but unhelpfully I, in my in my experience to say we don't need more copper. No, and um, I think that's 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 disingenuous and it's unhelpful because what it does is it creates expectations that cannot be realised. Exact, exactly. Um, good. Okay, so th- that's probably not a bad time to conclude. Before I do, I'd like to ask your opinion on a, on a few concepts in in electricity markets and ask you whether you think they're overrated or underrated as concepts okay uh, and you should you know short answers are good one one word or one word in a sentence is is, a, is the perfect is the perfect way to do this okay so let me, let me start this off and actually interestingly we've touched on a lot of a lot of them today so the first concept is markets for electricity during the energy transition uh, so you know, using market signals, you know, prices to determine what happens in the electricity system. Do you think markets for electricity in the energy transition is an overrated or an underrated concept? Underrated because if you can have all the technology in the world and you get the market wrong and you're going to fail. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, what about uh, and again, again, I'm foreshadowed something. Flexible demand as a solution to security of supply and grid stability. Uh, is it overrated or underrated? Mm, I'm going to give this is a very personal opinion. Even some of my colleagues might disagree with me. I think it's overrated. I'm a bit nervous about the proposition. If I'm running a business, my primary business is to serve my customers. And if I need power, I want reliable power. And increasingly, I want green power. Yeah. I'm not sure I want to be distracted by the TSO or anybody else telling me that I might want to switch you off here or there. Can you be flexible? So I worry about that. I think it has a, it has a role to play, but a much I think a smaller role than most people some people yeah. might suggest yeah it's an inter- i mean for That's most ha- businesses it, the cost of that- electricity is just well tiny. i've run business i've run businesses yeah. and in chemicals electronics and you know i do i want to be bothered about small savings from switching off my power when i've got customers i have to serve i don't know i think the, the, the jury's out but it's i think i would rate it i would say it's it's overrated at the moment yeah yeah it would definitely need to be seamless i i I think to be worth it okay the final concept is the role of electricity in decarbonizing the global economy so in a number of european countries we've got we've got a debate you know molecules and electrons and hydrogen and and ccs and these types of things um so if we're going to get to net zero assume we'll get to net zero at some point globally um do you think the role of electricity in 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 providing energy is overrated or underrated Oh, no, I think um, electricity is absolutely at the epicenter of this. Um, absolutely at the epicenter, because ultimately, um, electricity then can ultimately. Um, if I take the great example. Great, this is a great question to a chemical engineer, because if I look at the hydrogen proposition, and ultimately the hydrogen, the hydrogen, which is a chemical solution, arguably is going to come from green electricity if the whole thing's to be sustainable so electricity yeah. is i i you it's at the epicenter it's not the most it's not the only critical thing but by goodness yeah. is it is it is it center stage absolutely yeah um, electrons first and then the molecules will follow yeah interesting okay great well that's that's um that's a, a useful time to to conclude um you, Mark, you've clearly got an exciting role. You're, you're bringing plenty of energy to it, uh, and at a, a vital time for the for the for the All Island system, and frankly for the for the, for the world in in general. Um, so, uh, very much look forward to watching it unfold over the coming years. Um, Indeed. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, Mark Foley, CEO of Airgrid, thanks so much for joining me. John, a great pleasure as ever. Look forward to talking to you again in the near future. That was John Federson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, speaking to Mark Foley, CEO of Airgrid PLC. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.